Hello and welcome to In Our Tax Time, a series of conversations with senior and respected figures from the tax world. I'm John Whiting and the aim of these uh, discussions is to look back at things that have helped shape the tax world, the profession and the system that so many of us work in today and perhaps by looking back we can understand a bit more about the, well, the tax world we now live in. Today I'm delighted to welcome to the uh, hot seat, as it were, Leonard Baton, who is known to many as a very senior and influential and very widely respected member of the Inland Revenue, Leonard, and I think there you ended as Deputy Chairman, I think. That's right, yes. yes and indeed. certainly I remember you as the man who, well, largely ran the tax system when I was uh, first getting involved, but of course since retiring from the revenue you've, well, in today's terminology, gone plural by, I know you're involved in a lot of church mm. groups, low incomes tax reform group, and indeed um, specialist advisor to the House of Lords, I At think. At one time, yes. At one yes, time. Indeed. Well, hopefully we can talk about those, but as you might expect, what I'd like to mm. focus on is some of your time with the Inland Revenue, and um, mm. perhaps we can begin at the beginning, because, well, when did you start and what made you join the Revenue? Well, I started in 1957. Mm -hmm. I was uh, fortunate enough to be successful in the competition for the administrative class of the civil service. And very unusually in those days, I chose the Inland Revenue mm -hmm. rather than any other department. I think I was pretty unique in doing that. And um, <coughs> the reason I did was that I'd read well, I'd read PP, but economics in particular, when I was at university. And um, I had been very interested in public finance. And although, of course, that didn't go into the detail of taxation, obviously the sort of general principles of taxation were part of that, and I thought that was interesting. And uh, so the, that was why I put down uh, as my first choice going into the revenue, and I suspect I was probably <laughs> the, the only one who ever did so. <laughs> and, because uh, the and Foreign so Office or <laughs> yeah, whatever tended yeah. to be the well, first. Well, the Foreign Office was separate, but the yeah, Treasury or. The Treasury. Or, 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 yeah. So, what was the revenue like when you joined it in the late 50s? How did you find it? Well, in a way, the part of the revenue I was in was almost like a gentleman's club. And I use the word man deliberately yes. because, um, as you probably were aware, although there are a lot of women went into the civil service during the war, uh, those who were married had to leave after the war. And then if subsequently they stayed on but got married, then again they had to leave. So by the time I joined um, the, 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 the administrative part of the in a revenue which we'll doubtless go on to discuss. There were only two women out of 60 or 70, I suppose. Okay. I'm not quite sure when the marriage bar was dropped, okay. because certainly one of those two women <laughs> married later and stayed in the revenue. But one, Gwyneth Walters, uh, who only died earlier this year, remained a spinster all her life. Almost but, uh, to keep her career, it's very well, sad. To what extent that was, I, I don't know, but certainly uh, it, it, it's amazing by modern standards. But, uh, yeah, and you describe it as a bit of a gentleman's club in that sense, but was the, was the actual system gentlemanly, do you think? Well, yes, of course, we were, we were rather the um, almost the exclusive part. I mean, there was the very the, the central office which was uh, divided really into two parts, one called stamps and taxes and one called establishments. But dealing with the policy side, stamps and taxes, as if stamps were almost equal to taxes, natural right. taxes, it was a very small part, as you might imagine. Um, and we were the central core. And uh, of course, then there were the branches. Of course, by far the biggest branch was the chief inspector's branch. Uh, and um, then there was the accountant general's branch, which was mainly the collectors um, and some of the auditors. And they went down, I think there was still this tithe redemption office. I, mean, I can't remember how many <laughs> staff there were in that, but I mean, the, so when we had this uh, enormous array of branches and coordinating the lot, there was this, the, the, there was this central office yes. with, with the 
with the two bits by far the larger bit was stamps and taxes and establishments was um, uh, a, 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 perhaps a fifth sixth of the total well, I suppose that central coordination you can see overtones of it in today's central policy unit but what, what, what did you see as the sort of main problem facing the revenue was it avoidance or just um, getting the job done well I yes I'd to begin with, I would say, as far as I was concerned, certainly as very junior and much involved in the higher echelons, as it were, I would say just getting the job done, dealing with the all the lot of lot of the work for the juniors were, was dealing with ministerial correspondence and replying mm. to complaints and whatever you're dealing with, and doing the perhaps secretary of committees and sort of fairly low-level stuff generally. And then, of course, when the issue of avoidance really, uh, <laughs> really came on top of us, with mm. or on top of me, with the Finance Bill 1960 right. and uh, Clause 26, uh, Section 28, as it became, and Section 412 of the 1970 Act. I'm afraid I 460, as I remember it, ah. <laughs> I think, and, uh, and 703 to oh, newer yeah. people. Well, oh, that's yes, that's that's right, yes. Yes, um, but that that really was a very major issue in its day, and it took up several days getting mm. through um, at the Parliament. Of course, in those days, the whole whole of the finance bill was taken on the floor of the House, and so right. um, you know the the business managers weren't too pleased if they had things that went on for too long. So the, there was no committee stage and no going off to... Oh, there was a committee stage, but, but it was committee of the whole house. Of the whole house, yes, right. Yes, yes, the whole of it, yes. yes, yes, yes. And then, of course, in about... Sorry, just picking up that point. Then in, I think it was 66, possibly 67, they took it all upstairs in what was then called standing committee. And that wasn't very popular. And in the following year, they introduced the system that we have today with two or three debates on the floor in committee of the whole house and the rest going upstairs to, as I say, what was then called a standing committee. Right. Now you've started to talk about policy development, which is definitely something I wanted to ask you about. and That's clearly been a significant part of your professional career with the revenue and of course you you had a spell in the Treasury, I think, for Yes, I, well, well I it, had I two, two uh, spells when I was seconded to the Treasury. The first I was private secretary to uh, Jack Diamond, who was, I think, the first chief secretary. Uh, and he, by the time I was um, working for him, he was in the cabinet as chief secretary. Um, and then, of course, I came exposed to um, a whole range of issues that I had not come across before. Because and he was this is in the 1960s? 68. 68. Uh, and he, of course, was the uh, a Treasury Minister primarily involved with expen public expenditure, but he was also in charge of taxation under the chance, mm -hmm. as it were, but he merely drove, we drove, drove the um, ta taxation agenda also. Um, and then later, in the late 1970s, I had a couple of years in the Fiscal Policy Division of the Treasury. As it, as it was then. Of course, the, the relationship between the policy side of the Treasury on taxation and the inner revenue was really quite different from the arrangements we have today. It was a much a smaller part of the policy role, and you were basically coordinating it and linking it across into the um, wider Treasury interests. So you didn't get, well, of course, I don't really know, so I haven't been in the in the Treasury since the merger, but obviously the, uh, the Treasury has a much stronger role in the development of fiscal policy today than it did then. Right, so it really was the revenue and the Treasury coordinating. And Yes. And you, you, your role, you've described two spells within the Treasury. Were ministers listening to you? Did ministers do their own thing? or? How was the relationships? Well, obviously it varied between the individuals, um, and uh, but on the whole, I think the answer is they did. Uh, mm. They didn't always, obviously, didn't always agree, and um, 
uh, they have their own views, but I think it was there were very few ministers who didn't pay attention to mm. what the revenue was telling them, and um, they either accepted it or often things were developed. I mean, you sure. know, you, 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 the revenue would be the same ministers. Well, I don't think you can really do that, but of course you could do it in this way, as it were. So, say in the course of a a discussion over a period of weeks or months, you would develop the policy with ministers. So, um, no, I, th I think, uh, what well, may have been exceptions, but broadly speaking, the revenue advice was always valued. And I suspect we'd see very similar things today, because ministers coming in with their own ideas which get refined, mm. or of course things coming up from yes. revenue well, and treasury. Both ways, yes, 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 indeed, both directions. What about consultation? Because, of course, today and certainly over the last ten years, one of the big differences, I think, has been the amount of consultation yes, with much. CIOT and others. Did that happen in the Very 70s? much less. We basically had uh, two, two, two sets of consultation, one before the budget and one after the finance bill was published, with each of the four or five bodies, um, uh, the, the ICA, AEW, the CBI, the Chambers of Commerce, um, and of course in those days the Institute of Taxation. Of course. Um, and I must admit that when I started, the Institute of Taxation was not terribly highly thought of. Mm. And um, I, I think it was probably in the 70s. I mean. I might be wrong in pinning it down, but I'd have said particularly in the period when John Avery Jones was president. It is interesting, this consultation. I mean, as you say, there was a certain amount of discussion, and mm. I think I first met you as coming in as an institute, part of the institute mm. delegation mm. to, as you say, just discuss the finance bill and yeah. particular concerns, yes. because it was just yes. shaped. And then we had a introduced towards the end of my time, a finance bill day first, in which people oh, came yes. in and they could just ask factual, well, just ask details how this was seen to work, etc., and what was the reason for that, and so on. And then, after that, e each of the institutions came in and made their, made their case, and uh, obviously some of, them were, some of the points were accepted, and uh, I suspect in practice the majority weren't, but I mean, at least they would, they would discuss. But yes. there was nowhere near the amount of consultation in those days. In those days. I, don't I don't really know these days how people manage with the amount of consultation there is. I think some people would say it's almost consultation overload, but <laughs> that's uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. for another day, perhaps. But mm. it's interesting, Leonard, you've made one point of how things changed over your time. Mm. Have you any other observations as to how the Inland Revenue really changed over the time from, well, late 50s, early 60s to, well, almost today's HMRC as you see? Well, I would certainly say divide, what I can speak of is in, in, in my time, um, we the, I started off by suggesting how the sort of stamps and taxes but was really rather separate from the mm. Uh, Chief Inspector's branch and the others, but we worked. We uh, well, the, <laughs> the whole head office got totally revised, and, and policy division and technical division, management division. But people worked together much more. There was much more interchange, right? And um, so there was far less of the sort of us and them. Uh, by the time I left, um, obviously some individuals felt it more even played a part in it, whereas others were much more um, integrated. And of course, um, also there were um, very many more women as a, as a proportion. Once one little recollection of mine that you may be uh, amused by, um, in the early 1970s, I became responsible for looking after the sort of general interests and progress of the newcomers. So for the first couple of years, there was somebody over, overseeing the mm -hmm. development of their careers at that stage. And uh, so obviously, when um, they first arrived, they came to see me. And I can remember one day uh, a, a, a 
couple of girls came in, well, young women, I suppose I ought to say, and, um, and I would have been early 20s, I suppose. And the usual thing, I went through you know, broadly what was going on, what, how they would be treated, and what we expect from them, etc., and any questions. And one of the girls said to me, uh, would it be okay if I wore a trouser suit? <laughs> now, that's slightly flawed. <laughs> so I said, well, look, why don't you wear something formal for the first week or so and just look round and then see what other women are wearing and how, you, you know, how comfortable you feel in a trouser suit. But, um, you know, just uh, but that say, was early 1970s, which was a, a considerable development on what it was when I arrived, as I say, but nevertheless very different from what you might um, expect to get today. But then again, to put it into context, Leonard, I was starting out in Price Waterhouse at the time, and I suspect my relatively few female colleagues at the time were probably having similar conversations or <laughs> agonisings about <laughs> trouser suits. So let's just get a balance. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yes. Now, one thing I know, I think one very important part of your legacy to the revenue was the introduction of the adjudicator. Mm. Now, uh, I think that's been an excellent initiative mm. of the revenue mm. and made a big difference. What led you to that? And that well, idea? I, I think like so much of what um, happened in my time on the board, a great deal of it was goes, uh, the credit goes to Tony Battersall. Mm. rather than to any of the rest of it. It really came out of development in, in conversation. But of course, we were getting a lot of complaints, um, inevitably, and uh, some of them were justified, and a lot of them were overplayed. And I, mean, I think there was one television programme which uh, we th thought was very unfair, uh, in particular. Um, and so, I mean, we... I mean, obviously you've got to deal with the complaints. You, the second most important thing is to make sure you learn. When, when, when things have gone wrong, why have they gone wrong, and what can we do to learn from that? It's very important. Um, as well as, I say, trying to disabuse the complaints that weren't justified and uh, um, uh, where we felt really were rather cross. So, the, you know, the, the, all those. And, you know, in general discussion as to how we could best deal with that. We thought that, um, we had by then the, the, the ombudsman, yes. but of course comparatively few cases ever went to the ombudsman. Well, it, I can't remember involving the revenue, perhaps 15, 20 a year or something, the very long process, very long-winded process. And so, you know, they didn't really provide that resource that we wanted. And so, you know, the idea of having our own adjudicator came out of discussing the, the, the best way forward to deal with the complaints in the three ways that, that I was talking about. And a successful move in your view? I think so, very, very much so. Um, though, again, I don't know so much about what's happening today, but... Um, as it happened, I was uh, the departmental representative on the interview board, which the Civil Service Commission ran for the post. Something like 700 applicants. I'm okay. glad to say I wasn't required to get involved in all that. <laughs> we had a short, I forget what the short list was, but I mean, it was a manageable yeah. short list. And then we saw perhaps four, five, six people, I can't remember. Um, and one of them was, uh, was Elizabeth Philkin, and she was the outstanding character. Having left the revenue, Leonard, you certainly didn't sit idle. You've been involved in many things. I mentioned in the introduction uh, various groups, church groups, low incomes tax reform group. You've done a certain amount of campaigning, haven't you, for things like tax and marriage allowances? Yes, yes. Um, well, indeed. Um, Curious in a way that that in that I still have the same conclusions, but not the same reasons for right. them. <laughs> um, when uh, when I first retired, um, one of the people that I was in touch with was Don Draper, who was at one time in the Revenue and had left and gone to work. For PwC, and you possibly right. even came oh, across I him there. No, Don. Well, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and, um, but he had, I think, half retired then, and I had fully retired. And we were talking one day, and I said something alike, but I was very concerned about the fact that the married couples allowance was being whittled away, and there didn't seem to me to be anybody who was actually speaking up for it. And Don said, well, you know, if, if, if there is nobody doing it, uh, we, must, we, we must do it together. Right. <laughs> So anyway, so that that started, and um, we 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 at various means got in touch with this um, a charity care, a Christian Action Research and Education, and through them, as the obviously just a couple of people on their own wouldn't have made much impact, uh, but through care we we developed a campaign to retain the married couples allowance, which of course was unsuccessful because eventually in when Gordon Brown came in, yes. it, was, it was finally abolished and moved across into, well, from, from through various stages, uh, we end up with the present tax credit system. So do you think we still need a marriage? Oh, well, of course yes, we well, see, no, well indeed, you see, this was, back, what I, sorry, this was what I was going to say. I'm, I'm, Society has moved on a lot, even then there's 20 years since we started, and, I th and also the work which the IFS have done, uh, which really cast doubt on the value of marriage, that's sort of economic social value of marriage. I don't wholly accept it, but I think that they have shown, um, as I say, not as completely as they say, but I think they have shown that in actual fact a lot of the advantages of marriage stem from the fact that it is the better educated uh, people, be better income, higher income people and so on, who tend to get married. And it's those factors that actually influence outcomes for the children, mm -hmm. the stability and so on, rather than marriage as such. So, as I say, I don't wholly go, go along with the IFS, but I think they have put quite a dent in those arguments for it. Um, and I'm still personally very much in favour of marriage, but as I say, with the changes in society, I think it's less easy to argue for that. On the other hand, this um, enormous increase we've seen in the personal allowances since the uh, a coalition government, and which, as far mm. as we can see, the present government is going to maintain, actually, fact, benefits most people in the upper half of the income distribution particularly, obviously, two earner couples and single people without dependents who are further up the income distribution than uh, couples, single earner couples, one earner couples with children who are further down the income distribution. So you get this odd effect, uh, and of course there's the point that the um, increase in allowances is, doesn't help people whose income is is very small. Um, so, but the but the transfer allowance, which has now been introduced in a very weak form, as you know, actually, in fact, does do much more to benefit pe people who are in the bottom half of the mm. income distribution. Leonard Bateman, this has been a fascinating mm -hmm. discussion over so many years, and long may you continue to influence mm -hmm. the tax system. But for the moment, thank you very much for your time right. and your memories. Right. Right. Thank you. <laughs>